Welcome to the Indigo Podcast, an exploration of human flourishing at work and beyond. I'm Ben Barron of Indigo Anchor and Cleveland State University. And I'm Chris Everett of Indigo Anchor. For more information, please visit us at www.indigopodcast.com. Well, I never. (laughs) Dealing with slackers in groups. Wait, this happens? People slack in groups? (laughs) Oh, do they ever? And we all know that. Our listeners know that. So today we're going to talk about what is social loafing, what we know about it, and what does it do to groups and teams. It's not good. And how to prevent social loafing. And I just have to say that in all of organizational behavior as an academic discipline, as a uh, reality in our lives, social loafing is probably one of my favorite phrases. I know. Like, as it brings up bread, which I love (laughs) in my mind. Because it has loaf in it. (laughs) Because it has a word loaf in it. That's right. If it's a carb, I'm thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. So today we're going to talk about this thing called social loafing, and it does have to do with slackers in groups. Have you ever had any slackers in groups that you've worked with? Oh my gosh. Pretty much, you know, so everybody said, Oh, high school's kids games. You know, wait till you get to undergrad. It's going to be a whole different. You'll be in the real world. Hmm. I got to undergrad and it was like, wait a minute. I'm learning (laughs) some stuff. But this is not the real world, right? That's right. Then I get to grad school, right? And then at grad school, you're like, well, these are adults. Some of these are mid-career professionals. And they're, I mean, we're all going to be super serious. And if we have group work, no. no. This is ubiquitous. Yes, yes. This uh, problem of someone slacking off in the group. So this is, you know, and I I teach in a university. I sometimes have group projects, not not frequently, um, especially it's a little tougher with yet when you have online teaching. But, um, you know, one joke that I make when I do have group projects in a course is I I have a slide that I put up and I, you know, I, I say, um, when I die, I want the members of my group project to carry my casket so they can let me down one last time. <laughs> do you really? <laughs> I do. And everybody, <laughs> well, and here's the thing. Everybody gets it immediately and they all just start dying of laughter because we've all been on those group projects where someone wasn't pulling his or her weight. And then the other thing I say to my students is if you've never been in a group that had this problem, guess what? You are You're the it. social loafer. <laughs> I love right. it. Yeah. We got to put that that slide picture on uh, in the show notes, okay? So let's not forget yeah, that one. I'll find it. So yeah, this is a real problem in, in college projects, group projects, and of course, but this also happens in other aspects of life. Yeah, like in the, in the workplace. Right. And it's challenging in the workplace because you don't want to be the, the jerk, right? In, right. You know, you're just doing work and then, you know, your boss calls a meeting or something and, you know, everybody mumbles into the conference room and sits like, well, so now what? <laughs> hey, guys, we got this group project we got to do. And 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 the worst thing is it's got people off our team that are also on this group project. Yeah. So you, it's you're like, gee, great. And then inevitably there's somebody that doesn't pull their weight. Right. right. And then and you we'll- have to walk this minefield of. How do I, he's not on my team. How do I say, hey, Filson over there is a jack wagon who doesn't contribute. Yeah. Or yeah. or Jane over here is, gosh, she never does anything. I don't want to be on this group project with Jane because Total she's worthless. Numbskull. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. So <laughs> let's, let's go into the literature on this and uh, see what it says with regard to social loafing. So this is not a new phenomenon of interest within the social sciences. And we came across two good reviews, one review, one meta-analysis, to be specific, on this topic of social loafing. So I'd like to just uh, start with a a really good kind of first introductory few sentences from a 2014 review by Ashley Sims and Tommy Nichols in the Journal of Management Policy and Practice, because they provide a little bit of context around this. And I'm going to quote this, but I'm not going to say all the citations that are within it, because that would be laborious for our listeners. So... Here it goes. And I quote, <laughs> in 1913, a phenomenon was found that at the time did not receive sufficient attention. Maximilian Ringelman, a French agricultural engineer, observed that when a group of people collectively pulled on a rope, 
the output was less than when group members individually pulled on the rope. The results of this finding were not considered further until 1974 when some other people did another experiment to recreate it. And I still quote, the term social loafing was coined for the discovery that the participants working in groups exert less effort than participants working individually. It was described as having a detrimental effect of, on individuals and the institutions associated with them. So we can think of the game of tug of war, right? This is something they observed more than 100 years ago when people are pulling on a rope. And, you know, when you have a bunch of people pulling on the rope, they don't pull as hard as they would if they were just pulling by themselves. So, yeah, I think rope pulling is like a great, easy example to look at group effort, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, there's everybody in the group and anybody on the outside could kind of see. You may not see it if you're on that rope, but if you're watching, you are you can tell who's pulling their weight or not. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, to go a little bit further on this definitional piece of social loafing, in a meta-analysis by Stephen Corral and Kipling Williams, here's how they put it. And I quote from them. Formally, social loafing is the reduction in motivation and effort when individuals work collectively compared with when they work individually or coactively. When working collectively, individuals work in the real or imagined presence of others with whom they combine their inputs to form a single group product. When working coactively, individuals work in the real or imagined presence of others, but their inputs are not combined with the inputs of others. Determining the conditions under which individuals do or do not engage in social loafing is a problem of both theoretical and practical importance. So the idea here is that when people are working on something that contributes and that the inputs or the what you're doing, you know, your work output is going to be combined with everybody else's, that's when you have social loafing uh, oftentimes starting to occur. And as we mentioned with the group project, there is a lot of practical relevance and importance for this idea. Uh, we want in our organizations and on every team that I've been on, you want it to be, as we oftentimes say in this podcast, firing on all cylinders. You want every member of the team to be fully engaged and fully contributing in the way that they can. And when you have someone who is socially loafing, that is not occurring. Yeah. So this is the thing I always wanted. Well, if I don't care and we'll get into this in a minute. If I don't really care about we're doing what we're doing as a team, you know, maybe my heart's just not in it. And there, there can right. be a collective morale situation. But I remember there was a band that was in college started uh, by this guy called the Electric Boogaloo Boogie Band. And they were a horn band. We played rock salsa. So this was back in the days of Creed and everybody. Mm. Everybody was trying to be super cool. And we were a bunch of music major nerds playing salsa dancing music and a, and a lot of swing when swing da- Brian Setzer and all that stuff was going. Okay. Well, I wanted to be in this band so bad. Like they were by far the best band on campus. You know, everybody play their three or four cool rock songs. And then we'd close out whatever college music events with two or three hours of, of get down party dance music. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I remember I wanted to be in that group. And so I went up to the head of the band. I was like, listen, man, you got to fire your guitarist and let me in. <laughs> right and he was like what i'm like i'll i'll play better than him i'll work harder than him and so when i was in that group as far as putting together charts arranging rehearsals like all the, everybody was firing on all cylinders because they really gave a rip you didn't want to be seen as a social loafer right. so you you would almost like go out of your way to contribute contribute right. more right so what's and what's really good about that example chris is is that okay, you're all bought into, I guess, the mission or what you're trying to do. But the other thing, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, one reason psychologically why social loafing probably didn't occur in that situation is that all of your individual contributions to the team are very visible in a music group like that, right? Especially one of that size, perhaps. How many people were on the team? Or Uh, I don't know. There was ten. We had a full horn section and everything. It was, it was, yeah. But, but, but it was, but it was at the level where you still could tell, like, if someone was prepared or not, or if if someone, uh, you know, was contributing or not. When when people's individual contributions to the group are kind of nebulous, if they're not well defined, or if they're kind of invisible, it's a lot easier to socially loaf. Yeah. Like big lecture classes, 
yeah. with ill-defined groups. And I mean, I remember going to professors with the other people in the group and being like, this person's not doing anything and it's driving us nuts. They should get a zero. But mm-hmm. but what do you think uh, when, when students come to complain? I mean, what's the challenge for you there, Ben? Well, the challenge for me is, first of all, I don't know if they're telling the truth, right? It, students Students try to lie to you sometimes. And I don't know necessarily whether or not they are just ganging up on this one person. No, that's probably not the case. I don't know if they'd have a huge incentive to do that. Um, you know, the, but the other problem as a professor is like, what, what do I do with that? Well, I guess I could, uh, you know, dock the person's uh, grade, that one person, but then they're going to get, you know, they're going to have a case to say, oh, well, you know, you're, they're just being mean to me or, or whatever, right? It gets in a lot of kind of he said, she said types of situations there. So actually what I do when I have group projects in a course is I do some of the things that we'll talk about here today in in which I set very specific examples and expectations around what what is social loafing. I actually have a conversation about social loafing before the group project starts. And I say, look, this is something that happens. We've all been in these projects. Let's make this one not like the others. Let's make this a good project. Then I also have an individual component usually that's graded separately. So yeah, everybody gets the same grade on the group project. But that is one part of your overall grade on the on the project. So you have an individual component that you have to turn into me. I grade that. You have the group project. I grade that. We average them together, and that's your grade on the overall project or something like that. And that provides an incentive for everyone to have that individual contribution that we'll talk about. So that, that tends to work a little bit. And I think that applies to the workplace, too. You want to know what people are doing. Um, you want to be able to see those individual contributions and have them clearly defined. Otherwise, it's just going to turn into a big mess and socially loafing will be more prevalent. Pro tip for all those university professor listeners that we have. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, yeah. so Ben, let's talk about, so we, we've kind of defined social loafing at this point. And mm-hmm. let's talk about what this does to groups and teams. Yeah. Well, I, I think just obviously it, it's not good. Um, and you know, we, we have all had those experiences in which we were on a team where someone was the social loafer and, you know, it can actually make people pretty resentful. Like you're just kind of thinking, oh my gosh, I'm doing all the work and this person's getting away with doing nothing. Um, and you know, going back to my example with, uh, what I tell students, another thing I tell my students is, Hey, this happens in the real world. So you're going to have to be able to deal with it like in this group project. Um, so they don't really like that answer, but it is, it is a reality. And, uh, so, you know, when we look at the literature, there are, um, a number of things that we can say. The first thing is people have been studying this since 1913, at least, right? Um, (laughs) the the lawn has been mowed on this area of research to my estimation. I don't think there's a whole lot that we don't know. Perhaps there is, I, I am not, this is not my specific area of research, but we've been studying, looking at this for a long time. And, One of the biggest findings is that it is common. This is not just in your imagination. It happens across different types of tasks. It happens across different types of people, different types of groups. So, you know, uh, it's not in your imagination. Right. And so let's let's talk about so in groups and teams, you know, you get sorted. Sometimes the job you're in isn't, you know, you know, when I was four, I imagined I'd be processing payments for. XYZ medical equipment company. Right? It reminds, me yeah. of, reminds me of some commercial. I don't know what it was for uh, a, a long time ago, where it was like these little kids all saying things about adult jobs. Like one of them said, I want to file all day long. Oh, yeah. I, what was that commercial? <laughs> I don't I don't, listeners, if you know what that commercial is, send it in. We'll put it in the show notes. But yeah, yeah. no, I mean, it's like there's just this whole thing and life happens, right? You know, you, you've got an elder care situation that you didn't anticipate. You know, there's a car. Re- I mean, all kinds of different stuff. You're in a town that there's just not everything that you'd want to do available to you. But mm-hmm. one of the things that social loafing occurs that's from the, the, the evidence here is it occurs because people think their effort isn't likely to lead to a valued outcome. Right. So that's kind of, you know, in organizational behavior terms, that's kind of classic expectancy theory of motivation type stuff. So, you know, if we don't think that what we're going to do is going to lead to something we want, yeah, we're kind of like, eh, I don't really want to get involved with this. I don't, I don't feel very motivated. My motivational force is likely going to be low. Um, so, you know, 
just improving your project management and you know possibly the people management, it won't necessarily get you uh, to 100% of your team um, because those individual motivations do play a role. And that should be something that's curated. Uh, it should be something that you consider if you can, especially when you're thinking about, okay, who's going to be on this team? Uh, sometimes we don't have a choice. You know, sometimes you have to play with the, the team you've got. Uh, other times you maybe are setting up something special and that when that is the case, then you want to be thinking about number one, do people have the right skills, knowledge, abilities, and other characteristics that I need on this team? Right. And number two, do they have the motivation? Um, so those two things are very important if you're putting together a team to help avoid social loafing. Yeah. So when I look at new managers, most of them don't get to pick the team, you know, they just yeah. have their team. And and lots of time it's like, okay, new manager or manager XYZ, maybe you've been in the role 10, 15 years, it's fine. Um, they're just focused on, okay, how do we need to divide this work? We're going to do 12 widgets a day, or we're going to start off with this kind of phase, and we'll go to that phase, and then we'll be able to deliver in August when this is due. And they communicate that, and then things start to slip. Mm -hmm. And that's because you've paid attention to the project plan. Maybe you've even brought in some groundbreaking new project management methodologies that you're super excited about, but that's not going to get you there. Right. And and you've got to appeal to the motivations of your team. Now, if you aren't like solving cancer or world hunger or something, or you're, if your team, if, if this is something mundane. So here in the military, we get these inspections where, well, you just got to check the box on these agreed upon procedures. Everybody knows what to do. And it's really lame. Like they're one of the t uh, tools and techniques you can use is appeal to the people, to the kinds of people they want to be. Listen, mm -hmm. guys, this this project stinks or this project isn't that fun. Right. But daggone it, we're going to hit it out of the park because that's who we are as a team. Right. We have a reputation for excellence. You know, making that appeal to those existential things of the heart can help go there. But because when people don't think that their efforts are going to lead to, you know, as the literature says, a valued outcome, you got to create that valued outcome for your team. Right. Right. That's well said. And, you know, some other things we know from the literature on social loafing is that people are more likely to engage in this under a certain set of circumstances. Uh, so, for example, we've already mentioned this a little bit, but when people's individual contributions aren't very easily identified or evaluated, you might have some social loafing. So, <laughs> yeah, that's like when you have a cohort of numbskulls sitting around. And it's just not moving fast. You're like, who's not pulling their weight? And everybody mm -hmm. does a little timid leg. You know, that's where they yeah, draw their foot in the sand down. and mm -hmm. looks around like, oh, oh, it wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, you'll never know. See, you know? <laughs> right, right. Well, and, and if you as the leader of that team or you as a team member even haven't encouraged some specific definitions of roles and responsibilities and what people are actually going to do then guess what? Individual contributions are not going to be very easily identified or evaluated. If it's just, just kind of like, okay, well, we need to do X, Y, and Z, and it never becomes, Chris, how about you take this task, this is what done looks like by this time or date or whatever, right? Something specific so that then uh, Chris feels the motivation. To, he doesn't want to look bad in front of everybody else. Yeah, um, this is one of the reasons Scrum or using Kanban boards, Kanban, whatever, mm -hmm. the boards work, right? Um, because everybody sees what everybody's doing. It's, it's hard, harder, you know, it takes more pro loafing skills to pull loafing off. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, we've already mentioned one, uh, you know, in terms of motivation, when people don't think the task is meaningful, they will oftentimes be more likely to socially loaf, but also when they're working with strangers in a new group, in a new setting, this can occur. And, and some of that is just kind of this group formation type of dynamic that has to occur when you have a bunch of people who haven't worked together before working together for the first time. Um, you know, oftentimes people are a little bit uh, hesitant in those situations to perhaps be very directive with each other, mm -hmm. um, to provide each other honest feedback, right? Everyone's just kind of trying to feel it out and, and move forward in a way that uh, has some cohesion. Um, but this again goes back to the idea that, hey, you need to have some good expectations and set some clear roles, even if the group is new and if people don't really know each other. Uh, social loafing certainly happens more frequently when there aren't those clear standards in play. 
Right. This is why definition of done is so important. What's definition software. of done? Use use that. To, so so that this is one of those things uh, from uh, the Scrum Guide, and it's within a lot of the software. If they have a clear acceptance for your task, mm-hmm. and and everybody knows what that looks like, then you're not going to turn in half fake work. But one of the problems early on in software is what we call gilding. That's where you do, oh, I'm going to do this extra awesome stuff. But mm. having a clear definition of done sets the quality standard, you know, and, and manufacturers, they call it cost of quality. You know, don't build a widget that's far over engineered than what your people need if it costs a whole bunch of anyway, you could look up Google cost of quality and definition of done. But it's this idea of everybody understands a clear standard of what kind of work they gotta turn in. Yeah. Well, and what's what I found really interesting. And this is, you know, comes through our work together, Chris, when we've been doing this with clients or when we've been doing it with our own projects is defining what done looks like for any task actually takes a little bit of effort because sometimes when you start having that conversation, Mm -hmm. you realize, oh, my definition of done was a little off from what someone else thought. Let's really go back and forth here to come up with that shared definition of done. And that way you can have a clear standard that you need to deliver upon and that can decrease this phenomenon of social loafing. Right. So, and here's the other thing. When you expect others in the group to perform well. Yeah. Like that, that's like a cultural standard. They're going to perform well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but when and, somebody thinks that I'm just a also ran in the project, mm-hmm. well, that's not, that's not very sexy, is it? <laughs> right. Right. Now, there is a, a little bit of a flip side. And it's kind of interesting when it comes to other people on the team. So if you, you're on a team and you think everyone else is a rock star and you maybe have a little bit lower opinion of your own knowledge, skills, and abilities, given that task, you might be a little bit hesitant to, to really kind of pull your weight, so to speak, um, because you might think, oh, well, you know, everyone's doing amazing. So I'm just going to kind of let them keep doing amazing while I do kind of my, my uh, underwhelming contribution to the team effort so yeah and if you're on a team where everybody's amazing like i'll acknowledge it i'm like guys you guys are like the chainsaws and axes here and i'm just a tiny bit of sandpaper help (laughs) help me be more like you i mean this is a time they tell you find yourself in the presence of giants like go put yourself out there right but that's somewhere where you could work it's like guys how can i pull my weight more i want to grow and Mm -hmm. and, i mean that's actually an opportunity in the right setup so. That's right. That's right. So those are some conditions under which social loafing is more, uh, more, more likely to occur. We can also look at what we know about teams in general here. So when you have a large team, this is fairly intuitive, but when you have a large team, it's pretty easy or a lot easier to hide, right? If you have a team that is 50 people that are all working together on some project, well, you know, <laughs> you can kind of fly under the radar and not do a whole lot probably and get away with it because it is so hard for those individual contributions to actually be defined and for anyone to monitor them. And this is why whenever I tell managers who are thinking about setting up a special team or working on any kind of project, and actually I've, I've done this with uh, with a nonprofit board that I'm on. I've said, you know, we want to have a, a, the right size of board um, you want to have the right size of team and too large is not necessarily the way to go. Um, I would prefer to have fewer, you know, the minimum number that you need to get the job done well is oftentimes the right idea. Now, sometimes you got to pull off these lo- large team or large teams of teams, mm-hmm. cross-functional shenanigans. And here's the sure. thing. If you're going to step into that place and do it well and not have a bunch of wasted velocity on social loafing, you need to have some facilitation techniques engaged. So if you're in a learning development role and that's something that it's just always try to do it with smaller teams, but there's times where you can't. Yeah, it's Mm -hmm. just required. You're having some big digital transformation project. If you're in the leadership and development or HR function, you need to make sure that you get those critical staff trained up on facilitation, large team, project management, and a whole bunch of your typical PMP guys not going to be, or gal is not going to be able to pull this off, right? right. There, there's very specific techniques there, and it needs to be couched in a culture, which we'll get to that culture stuff in a, 
in a in a bit. But here's this other thing: is having distinct roles and individual team makeup is super important. Mm -hmm. So when people have a unique contribution, they tend to loaf less. So <laughs> if you're if you're on a mission to Mars, you can always t only take a so many people, right? Because the shuttle's only so big. You're not going to put a bunch of redundancy on those roles, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to take nine scientists and one pilot. <laughs> you know, what if that pilot has a heart attack or something? You're like, right. well, I guess we'll be studying Mars for a while because yeah. nobody can drive us home. Yeah. Well, I mean, you even think about the, our little team that we have working on this podcast. Um, you know, we, we kind of share responsibility and we co-develop what we're going to talk about and, and things like that. But we do have some specific roles. So, for example, you know, you do all of the, uh, at least the initial editing and all of that kind of work to put our podcast together. That's a very unique contribution. And it'd be very obvious if you didn't do it, right? Thanks, and, Ben. One of yeah. our episodes is going to have crappy <laughs> post-production and i'm gonna get stoned for it <laughs> well, yeah exactly and, and, and that'll be our case in point that oh well it looks like chris was a social loafer that week um <laughs> that's right so having that unique contribution is very important and this is where you as a leader and a manager have a unique opportunity to clearly define roles responsibilities we already talked about definition of done being one way to do that and this is you know your one of your jobs as a leader is to initiate some structure and at the same time, have individualized consideration for all the different team members. So, you know, put that structure in place. Don't let it be too amorphous. You've got to balance kind of autonomy with structure in any group or team. Uh, yeah, I, I say that to my junior officers in the military and to people, executives I coach all the time. Your job as a leader is to create structure and ambiguity and then drive results. Mm -hmm. I mean, what else are you there for to like? to attend the meeting and send an update email. If you're an yeah. organization that that's what you, that's all you require from your leaders, go do pushups. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go do pushups. If you can't be smart, at least you'll be strong. <laughs> that's what we say. <laughs> oh man. Well, I never, um, so, <laughs> you know, another interesting area from the research is, you know, some people have looked at how social loafing can actually be adaptive, right? Um, that's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, so, I mean, at, despite every manager's thoughts of plotting and designing, people mm. are incredibly uh, self-organizing, resilient people. Um, if it's baloney, they'll figure out how to drag their feet. If, yep. You know, it's all that stuff. But here's the thing. If you have poor workload balancing for your employees, you know, because they'll keep sending, okay, we're going to keep sending down more and more and more work. Right. Down below. Eventually, there's a snapping point. They just can't do it. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and who is it in the organization who oftentimes gets dumped on with all of the extra responsibilities? It's the hard workers, the people who drive results. Oh, yeah. Totally. And, you know, you just have to be very careful that you're not overburdening your top talent. I mean, to some degree, you know, yeah, you should give them more responsibility, more things that they can work on. Uh, but you got to be careful because if you do that too much, then you're just punishing people for working hard. Right. And, and then sometimes the evaluation system, right? You don't yeah. evaluate people's group efforts. It's okay. Let's look at your quarterly or annual performance evaluation and it's all individual efforts. So one of the things that people will do that's adaptive is, well, they'll drag their feet on group projects mm -hmm. or they won't put a whole lot of work saving themselves for their individual tasks and efforts that they get reviewed on. And so, but this is a problem, not necessarily of the individual, although individuals definitely have problems. This is a problem of like designing what the day-to-day -day work looks like. It has problems to do with how, what's the capacity of teams and stuff. And, you know, if you're in a growth situation, you may have 20 ideas to grow your organization, but only enough staff and, and cash to do one or two a year. Right. And yet right. you, you get, keep hammering it down. Eventually, social loafing and other ways that people self-organize to keep their sanity and not want to, you know, drink heavily every night after work is going <laughs> to kick in. <laughs> For sure. So we've talked about what social loafing is. We've talked about some of the big research findings around when it occurs, what makes it more likely. And these lead to some specific ideas around how we can prevent social loafing, or at least decrease the probability of its occurrence. Yeah. There's numbskulls that are going to loaf no matter what. I mean, I yeah. don't, <laughs> you can put them on a, 
treadmill <laughs> with the cattle prod at their back. And they're still going to feel like, man, how much shot can I take here before I really, you know, <laughs> there's always those. So, well, but let's yeah. talk about what we can do, you know, the best that we can do. Right, right. So one of the key drivers here is culture. And when right. you have a high performance organizational culture in which social loafing is something that people are aware of and people are on the lookout for, uh, then you're, it's going to be less likely. Um, if you have a culture where, you know, it's just kind of tolerated, then it's going to be more likely. You know, I, I, one of, uh, I had a friend once who, who used to say that, uh, you know, one big part of culture is, you know, what you tolerate in the organization. Um, you know, those things that you as the manager or you as a team member are willing to ignore those pieces of, of your work life that that becomes part of the fabric of the organization. So if you're tolerating social loafing as a leader, as a manager, as a team member, then it's going to be more likely. So you have to start to build those norms, those expectations around, hey, that's just not the way we do things around here. You know, um, this is how we work in teams and groups. This is how we we work together in a way that is truly helping everyone to fire on all of their cylinders, so to speak. Yeah. So, that's so a big there's piece. this explicit culture. You know, yeah. you got a plaque with your values. Maybe you worked with a <laughs> consulting group like us to get right. get you a, a cultural statement that's worth a darn, yeah. right? So, but then there's what everybody, oh yeah, we know we say that, but here's what's really goes on. Mm -hmm. And this is where the moral landscape and the ethics of your manager throughout your organization is going to buy you so much more than you can even quantify from a financial results perspective, yeah. because they're, they're teaching everybody within the organization. Well, this is how we roll in this org. Right. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and so you got it. You can't fake this stuff. We say that all the time. You cannot fake culture. So if you have a toxic culture or if you're like, well, we're, we're achieving these financial goals, I'll just let it go. Eventually that's going to bite you in the keister. That's right. Yeah, it'll bite you in the keister. So you just said keister. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> but but that's the thing. Culture, a lot of social loafing is a cultural issue. Yeah, that that it's accepted there versus you know some of it when people come to a job interview and meet people and say, well, what's a day to day here at the job look like? They're like, ooh, I'm a social loafer. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get get it, get along with loafing here. <laughs> you know, let let them go to the competitors because your culture yeah. will self-select the kind of, you know, people you want. The numbskulls can go elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. You know, another big finding here from the research is that um, it's kind of a tangential finding, but it's an interesting one. And this has to do with perceived organizational support. Yes. And th we've talked about this on the podcast before, but perceived organizational support is all about this idea that and, and this this very well researched idea, a um, lot of substantiating evidence for this, that people kind of generate these global beliefs about their work organization and their relationship with their work organization. More specifically, they develop these beliefs about the degree to which their work organization cares about their well being and values their contributions. Right, and a big driver of this is you know your supervisor support. If my supervisor really cares about my well-being and values my contributions, I'm likely to attribute that to the organization and think, yeah, this organization cares about me and they value what I do. Well, when that is high, um, you know, social loafing is a little bit less likely because people feel this obligation to reciprocate back to the organization and uh, to, to perform well. So that's a, another kind of, it's a cultural piece, it's a communication piece, it's a leadership piece that can be an important ingredient in this this whole recipe yeah i hear ceos say all the time why why won't my you know the people in my organization care about this company like it's their own company mm -hmm. well first of all it's not right like <laughs> if you sell out to venture capital you're the one with the boat and the caymans not not joe worker right, all right right unless you're unless you're an esop or something right <laughs> right so um, that's an employee stock ownership program. Kroger is a big example of one, a big ESOP here in the U.S. But if you want to get closer to individuals treating the org like it's their own, having strong perceived organizational support is a key element of that.
That's right. That's right. So another way that you can prevent this, we've talked about this a little bit already when we were talking about some of the drivers of social loafing, but setting some clear expectations of people's performance and how teams and people within those teams need to perform. Uh, that is a key way in which those individual contributions can become more clear uh, and you can hold people accountable for their performance instead of just kind of letting them you know, work under the radar, so to speak. Yeah, if you're kicking off a new cross-functional team or a team that's just getting put together temporarily for a project, I'd love to just say, all right, let's set some behavior standards here. You know, emails will be responded to within 24, 48 hours. Um, mm -hmm. If somebody can't do something, they will notify the group. You know, the, these kinds of things. So setting expectations of those performance can kind of set the tone for how work's going to get done. Yeah. And going back to these individual contributions, make them visible. So, you know, this is where, for example, in the Scrum methodology, the Scrum liturgy, as you sometimes call it, you know, this can be a powerful way to review who's done what and, uh, and, and make that really visible to everyone um, because it kind of creates some social pressure. If Imagine at the beginning of the week where you all sit down and you're saying, okay, Here's everything that needs to happen. Here's the priorities for what we're going to work on this week. Here's who's doing what. And we have a clear definition of done for every single one of those tasks. Uh, then come Friday or whenever the kind of the end of that little cycle is, whatever you agree upon, you can go around the room and say, all right, tell me, where are you with this one, Jack Wagon? Right. <laughs> and <laughs> but let's let's make that a positive. So when somebody does something good, you can say, hey, thanks, Bill. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Jane, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Hey, Jane, you turned that in on time and that was really decisive for our team being able yeah. to go. And you can make that a pray. It doesn't always have to be, you know, as fun as it is to call somebody out sometimes, you know, <laughs> a more positive culture there around yeah. just praising the good can can be a key. I uh, no, I totally agree with you. You're you're absolutely right. And your you know, your recognition of what people are doing right should exceed the number of times that you point out what they're not doing right. Um, because that, that will reinforce those positive norms in the group and in the team. Uh, so, you know, another thing you can do to help prevent social loafing is to kind of check in on the task meaningfulness, right? This is where you actually have to get to know your people and understand their motivations a little bit more because uh, what is valued to one person in the organization as an outcome is maybe not necessarily valued to another person. People have different interests. They're at different stages in their careers. And so making sure that you have people assigned to tasks that they find meaningful, if at all possible, um, can help with motivation in this case. Yeah. And money can be a motivator. And so- but there's a, that's a mixed bag. We won't dive into that. But, yeah. you know, check out our other podcast episode uh, called Make It Rain, Money yeah. as a mo Motivator. Um, so also team outcomes as a motivator. I've been on teams where I really hated the project that we were doing and what we were on. But I had so much pride in the output of our team and our reputation within the organization that even though I was doing some of the most garbage tasks on that team or somebody had to do it, I would volunteer to take up those because I'd know these garbage tasks that nobody likes doing are going to trip us up. So I'm going to go ahead and take ownership of them because I want the reputation and the outcome of our team uh, to mm -hmm. be excellent. Yeah, yeah. Um, going along with that, you want to make sure that you have your goals well-defined. Uh, make sure that they are um, clear to everyone and so that you can all be rowing in the same direction. Uh, you know, another way that you can do this is having good processes in place. You know, assuming you have the right people in the room, the right team members uh, working on a project, you can have some sort of process. And we mentioned the scrum process. That's just one. There are many different ways in which you can organize work and kind of the rhythm of how a team does it, what it does. But this ensures that everyone is firing on all cylinders, making sure that you have all the, the different aspects of the project well-defined. And since you're not getting into the situation where social loafing might be prevalent. Right. And, and knowing, so if the org has clearly defined goals and strategy, and that's baked throughout the organization, mm -hmm. it's really important as a leader to describe to your team, this is how what we're doing fits into the larger plan. Yeah. Right. So, so people can say like, man, I'm doing this project. I'm delivering this. That's part of this key initiative that we're trying to do right now. And, and that that's important. 
That's right. That's right. So it reminds me of uh, Dostoevsky, the Russian author. Who, yeah, in his, the in brothers. His, yes. Well, in one of his other books called The House of the Dead, he's he describes um, prison life. And he's he talks about how, you know, one of the, the worst things that you can do to a person is make them work all day on digging a hole in the ground and then they fill it in at the end of the day. Right. right. It's this idea that we we hate doing work that has no purpose and um, making sure that people see how their team goals connect with overall organizational goals can be really motivating for folks so they can feel like they have some, you know, kind of it, just, it feels worthwhile. Right. Yeah. But I want to I want to camp this here. Everybody's like, yeah, just trick them into feeling like their work is meaningful so you can get better performance. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if you're an organization doing something worthwhile, you don't have to go through those manipulative games. And people can smell that baloney a mile away. So even if you're making, you know, sterilization for surgical products, I mean, anything that somebody's willing to pay for has value. Right. And you need to tie that value through your organization. You know, I just see this all the time. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, um, Bill, I think you're contributions are really great and it's just so shallow right. and and the hubris of thinking that your employee is stupid enough to buy your baloney that <laughs> golly come on come on <laughs> come on yeah so this needs to be genuine what i'm talking about is it's not about manipulation it's about communication because sometimes exactly. sometimes it might not be evident to that person in that moment about what how they're what they're doing connects to a bigger goal and you as the leader or manager may be in a situation where you have broader visibility on how that fits into the bigger picture. You know, so one example that is very prevalent in my mind is back when I was a, a young junior officer in the Navy aboard a, a, a guided missile destroyer out in the Arabian Gulf. And, you know, I worked with a bunch of electricians. I was in charge of a, the, the electrical division. And uh, it was hard for them sometimes to see how, you know, they're fixing of these little electrical issues and doing maintenance in the, in the you know, various nether regions of the ship had anything to do with the global war on terrorism. But it was my job to help them realize, you know, how what they were doing was appreciated, how what they were doing was very important for our overall functioning and so forth. So um, well said. Another thing you can do to prevent social loafing is be careful of how you reward behavior. So uh, if you are trying to reward a group, uh, make sure that that's you know has a good balance with individual rewards. Don't just re- reward everybody individually and then expect some sort of group outcome because then uh, people have no incentive to work together on any kind of project. So be careful there. Yeah. So if you're in HR performance evaluation, having a component of, especially if most of your work has a team element, having some way to evaluate that is important. Make sure you do it. Consult the literature. It needs to be evidence-based. So um, another thing is dividing effort based on difficulty. You know, Mm -hmm. since we know these problems exist in teams, having a bunch of individual works okay, you know, but more difficult tasks that are broader generally needs a team. So, you know, teams that are up to a difficult task can fire on more cylinders because there's actually more weight that needs to be lifted. Right. And another unique feature of a task that requires it to be a team task versus an individual task has to do with what we call interdependence of the task. Right. So if it's just something I'm doing, you know, where I could just do it and knock it out of the park and maybe it just kind of gets kicked into, you know, the overall team output, that's that's one way to do it. But if it's something that really requires what we call reciprocal interdependence, where everybody really needs to be working together on on the, the group project, um, then that should be a team project. And that's going to require you to uh, to make sure there's no social loafing involved. Right. And just to kind of wrap up perceived organizational support. Yeah. You know, if you're a manager, any kind of leader within an organization that can shape that, you really need to understand the literature related to that. Google it, take some classes. These are the kinds of things that will really shape the outcome, especially with social loafing, which is basically you're paying for labor labor you're not getting. Right, right, right. So, you know, before we uh, give everybody kind of the the wrap up on what we talked about today, I do want to just interject with, hey, 
little update on the new podcast format that we're doing. So um, as we mentioned in a short episode we recently released, we are now releasing more episodes. We have number one, an interview episode that releases on Tuesday mornings. We have this one with Chris and I that's going to be releasing on Thursday mornings. And we have a really fun one that's going to be starting to release here next week um, called The Agility Conversation. So you know, starting the week of August 31st, you'll be getting three podcasts a week from the Indigo Podcast, which is super exciting. And also, just an appeal to our listeners, get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you, indigopodcast.com or indigotogether.com slash contact. That's a great way to get in touch with us. Also, go out there, give us five stars if you think we deserve it, and give us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, because that really does help us in the rankings. Apparently, that matters. Yeah. So one of the things we've learned about our listeners is they're wicked smart. Yeah. Right. And they're super busy doing a lot of awesome work in different organizations, nonprofits and everything. So generally they're like, ah, we'll let, you know, the lay numbskull co contact them. We want to hear from you. If you're a CEO of a company or a VP, if you're the head of a nonprofit, if you're an IO psych professor that listens, please write in, tell us, how are we doing? How do you think we can improve? What would you like to see? Uh, and the other thing is, Bug people to subscribe and listen. We grow from support from listeners like you. Don't think, don't socially loaf on this one, right? <laughs> don't think the person on my left and right will do it. If you care about evidence-based interventions for individuals and organizations, hey, do your part. Help yeah. us spread the word. Yep. And the last thing, just kind of the housekeeping note, I want to give a shout out to uh, this one country outside of the U.S., that is uh, the, the biggest subscriber outside of the U.S., um, has the most downloads outside of the U.S., um, and it's not our neighbors to the north. It's not Canada. Canada's up there, but what, what country actually is it? It's Australia, isn't it? Yeah, it's Australia. So, you know, I know we have Kate Booth out there in Australia listening to us. Thank you, Kate. Um, but it's not just you because it's more downloads than just you. So uh, obviously other people in Australia. Anyway, I've been to Australia once. I would love to be there again. It's a great country. Thank you all for listening. So what did we talk about today in the episode, Chris? Okay, so we talked about what is social loafing. And we talked about what we know about it and what it does to groups and teams. And then we talked, so, talked about some practical ways in which uh, leaders and organizations can prevent social loafing and how they should view it. Thanks for listening to the Indigo Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider helping us by rating us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, telling your friends about us, having us on your podcast, or mentioning us on social media. Our website is www.indigopodcast.com, where you can access more information about us and this episode. Thanks again, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.